In this interview, we talk about the people and technology behind discourse, building thriving communities, and lessons learned at Stack Exchange. And we do it without video this time. Hey fellow coders, my name is Christoph. This is the Skeletor Code Show, where I interview top developers so we can learn from them. Today's developer, Jeff Atwood, co-founded Stack Overflow and later Stack Exchange. Stack Exchange is a network of sites, including Stack Overflow, and it has a massive community that's growing every month. But this is not the only big community built by Jeff. He's also known for his popular blog, Coding Horror, and more recently, for his platform called Discourse. We're going to be talking about all three of these and more in this interview. Jeff, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here. So you obviously have a knack for building communities like this because you didn't just do it once, but multiple times with your blog, Stack Exchange, and Discourse, which all receive serious amounts, serious amounts of traffic, but perhaps even more importantly, have a lot of interaction. The Stack Exchange site or network, for example, has 900 million visits, 6.4 billion page views, and millions of questions and answers. What makes you so successful at that? Do you build something people need and then use your network to spread awareness? How do you do it? How can we learn from you? Well, I, I think with Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, we set out with a problem. <clears throat> A problem statement and the problem statement was there was this site experts exchange mm -hmm. and Joel brought it to my attention and said hey we could build something like experts exchange but without all the evil and <laughs> I think it's good to have something you set yourself up in opposition to even though you don't really fight it's it's really that's not productive what you're really doing is building an alternative to something that's there so it gives you mm -hmm. a target something to look at something to displace and I think that was a really good way to frame what we were doing at Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange was, you know, we're trying to build something <clears throat> for the community that solves the essential problem of, you know, how do I ask a question and get an answer about something programming uh, mm -hmm. in a way that's community building, you know, that doesn't make me feel, I don't know if you guys remember Experts Exchange, but it felt like walking on the lot of a used car salesman. <laughs> because right. it was just really scammy the way they did it and the information was usually good because you were connecting two programmers together right that that were teaching and learning each other and that's the essence of programming to me is that you're always learning you're always teaching and teaching something is the best way to learn it and there's always somebody who has more kung fu than you no matter how much you know about a topic there's mm -hmm. always somebody who's not going to know more than you and vice versa there might be something you know more about than you know, another programmer in a particular area, because programming is so complicated. You know, there's so many different little areas of things that you do stuff that Absolutely. everybody gets to be an expert, depending on what you're looking at, you know? Mm -hmm. It was also the idea that, you know, everybody's an expert sometimes. Mm -hmm. It just depends what the question is. So <clears throat> I think starting out, it's good to have something to frame yourself in opposition to, not directly, but as, you know, and that, that also applies to my, my, new, my new project, Discourse, where the problem is that forum software was really terrible and still is pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to have something that I could offer people that was actually good, that they could build communities on, that could, they could be proud of installing. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, to me, that's the key. It's like, think, think about a problem. Like, what problem are you trying to solve? I'm not a big believer in sort of speculatively building things just because <laughs> you're bored or you want to build something. <laughs> It's more like, you know, tell me what the problem is. And this is the same thing I tell a lot of people that want to be programmers is, you know, well, first, it's good to dabble a little. That's fine. But think what the problem is. You know, what's the problem? You know, what, what, what pisses you off? What makes you angry? What, <laughs> what do you want to fix in the world, you know? So what kind of problem were you trying to fix with your blog then? Or was it just a, a way of dumping out your brain uh, or so solving problems that you personally had? Well, it was kind of the same problems we're solving with uh, Stack Overflow was that it's a public research notebook because people don't always know this, but one very, very supported way to ask things on Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange is to ask a question and then answer it yourself. And that's kind of what the blog is. It's me asking a question and then sort of answering it myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always like the comments 
Now, a lot of people lately have been sort of turned off by the idea of comments and there's too much argument, there's too much, you know, horrible things being done in comments. <laughs> and part of that is the fault of the people that have them. And I, I think if you're going to have comments, you should moderate the comments. Right. Some, shouldn't be the Wild West where anything goes. But I always loved community feedback on my blog post because I would learn a lot. You know, I would post, okay, here's what I researched, here's what I learned. And then I would get a lot of footnotes from other people that were sometimes very interesting and led me in other areas that were related and also interesting. So to me, the comments were a key part of what I was doing. And in the same way that what, the way I explain this to people is when you go to Amazon.com, can you imagine buying something on Amazon.com without, you know, the user reviews? No, definitely not. Yeah, not that's a me. really integral part of the experience, you know. Hmm. Other people's feedback on how this thing worked that you're looking at buying. And that's how I looked at my blog was like, this is integral feedback. It's like, am I full of crap? Am I completely <laughs> wrong? Uh, you kind of go to the comments to figure that out. Or maybe I forgot stuff because you always forget stuff, right? Like that's the hmm. human condition. And then the comments sort of help you remember. It's like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And, hmm. you know, I think that's great. And that's why we have um, on Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, we have essentially two levels of discussion. You have the question and the answer, and that's primary. You're supposed to ask a question, get an answer, or answer yourself, totally fine. You know, this is what I learned. I don't have a partial solution, but here's what I learned. And then there's the commenting system, which is like one layer above that where you're sort of putting post-it notes on the question, like, what about this? What about this? Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't address this. And same thing with the answers. You're trying to improve the question and improve the answer. The ultimate goal of every comment is kind of to be deleted at some level because you fold in the commentary by editing the post, right? Mm -hmm. Um, more like Wikipedia. It's sort of this stack exchange is this hybrid system where we were kind of building this Frankenstein monster of all these things that we knew were working on the internet. Like I knew voting worked because I had seen it work really well on Dig and Reddit to surface better content. Uh, ownership worked like blog. You know, it's my blog. You know, I'm going to garden in my garden because it's my blog. It's associated with my name. That's a very powerful concept. We wanted that in there. This concept of achievements from the Xbox world of, you know, rather than having a manual, you give people a list of achievements and they go, oh, interesting. How would I possibly go about getting these achievements? And that's how you learn the system. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, from Wikipedia, editing, that's the big one, right? Like, mm -hmm. So that you don't have these pages that just get old and out of date and useless over the years. Like, for example, one that I was very proud of recently was uh, one thing that's really still very hard to do in the browser is copy to the clipboard for variety of reasons. But lately, and I mean as of the last couple months, it's gotten better. Uh -huh. So there's an old question on Stack Overflow, you know, how do I copy stuff to the clipboard from the browser? And this was asked like three or four years ago, right? So it's old. You would assume it to be out of date and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and somebody posted a really good new answer to it. So I tweeted it. It's like, oh, this is great. You know, look what's coming up. Ways we can copy to the clipboard in the browser that aren't crazy Flash-based, you know, right. nonsense. Yeah. I mean, we don't even want Flash anymore. And Steve Jobs <laughs> was right. You know, we're trying to kill this thing off. Absolutely. Not add more of it. And it was a really great answer because it documented exactly what to do, what the browsers do. And it got a lot of upvotes to the point that it became one of the best answers to the question. Wow. It got like 20, 30 upvotes. So then all of a sudden, in this old question, you had a really good answer that was rising the way it's supposed to. You know, mm -hmm. granted, I, I helped by publicizing it because right. it was a great answer. Right. But that's the way the system is supposed to work. These aren't supposed to be these dead tombstones of information that you find. They're supposed to be like Wikipedia, which are more like living, breathing mm -hmm. artifacts that mm -hmm. change as people and time do. Is it fair to say that you also drastically helped, well, you and Joel, with both of your popular blogs, in getting Stack Overflow off the ground, getting more traffic to it? Because, I mean, yeah, all the comments and, and all the interaction is fantastic, but how do you do that without the traffic, right? How do you have? How do you get the traffic there in the first place? So, is it fair to say that both of your blogs really helped out uh, in the initial growth? Oh, I think absolutely they helped initial. I mean, it never hurts to be famous. I mean, right, whatever you're course. doing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, being famous obviously helps you. Uh, like one of my favorite old things I read online was like how to succeed at digital music distribution online. And step one was be Radiohead. You know? <laughs> if you're some band, Good advice. Of, then you, you have a different set of problems. So, of course, it helps. But I think what also mattered is that, you know, the quality of the tool was there. You mm -hmm. know, the approach was correct. It made sense. Um, because no matter how famous you are, if you point your audience to something that's terrible, mm -hmm. they'll look, but then they'll just walk away because why would they stay there? It's not doing anything for them. You know, it's not helping their, it's not making their lives any better. It's all they need to have. So even if you're not famous, you, you know, the goal is still the same. It's like build something that people want that's useful, that has demonstrated utility. And 
what I like to say is, you know, you're, you're building a road, and if you make the road really good, then people will forget the other road, the road to the bad thing you're trying to displace, will become like a footpath on a rocky trail, and your road will become a superhighway. That's a good way to put it, yeah. So I think, you know, focus on the quality of what you're doing. I mean, to me, it's, I have a very build it and they will come attitude towards this stuff, you know, of the quality matters first. Um, but of course, you should always be interested in like making sh you have make sure you have ways to get the word out on what's going on. In the case of Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, you become very dominant in the search results because the quality information is so high. Yeah, you know everything about that system is about strictness of keeping the quality inf information very high to the point that it pisses people off. You know how dare you say that I can't post my question? Mm -hmm. How dare you say that I can't? leave this non-answer on the question <laughs> and we had to teach people a lot it's like look this isn't about discussion this is about the results this is mm -hmm. about great questions great answers it's more like a classroom it's not mm -hmm. a place you come to sort of goof off and mm -hmm. hang out um, it's a place you come to really get stuff done you know mm -hmm. to, to work with your peers and there's a lot of discipline around that system and it, it creates these amazing search artifacts. So where Google is essentially the pitcher and where the catcher, right? It's like you type some question into Google about, oh, I'm having this problem, and then bam, you know, Stack Overflow becomes a very highly ranked result because it's also very fast. Mm -hmm. um, it produces amazing information, and it doesn't litter your screen with a bunch of nonsense, right? Like there's not ads everywhere. There's a few ads, um, but it's like the question, and then right under it, the best answer, and then right under that, you know, another good answer, another good answer. Another. So you have the, the question right at the top, and then a great answer right under it. So it's a very, very efficient way to get information. And I think that's really the key, uh, more so than me and Joel being famous. That helps. That never hurts, of course. Sure. Um, but, you know, focus on, you know, building that tool that, that helps people that some, solve some essential problem that they have. I want to talk a lot more about the issues that you ran into with a growing community like that and how you uh, solve these issues. But first of all, take me back to when you weren't famous when you first started blogging, how did you get that initial traffic to your blog? Did you use the same approach where you, you had great content, great posts, and you ranked higher in Google, and then that got you traffic? Or what did you do? What was your strategy? Well, that's the beauty of it. There were, really wasn't a strategy. It was just, you know, I'm going to write. <laughs> I'm going to have my, my public research notebook. And I think what matters in the beginning is consistency. If you're doing something that where you're producing the content, it's not about the quality of the tool. It's about continually producing reliable mm -hmm. artifacts, right? Like, you have to essentially do the work. There's this great blog post I have about Steve Martin talked about the hardest thing in comedy is not being great. It's being consistently good every night. Mm -hmm. That is the hard thing about comedy, uh, you know. And, and I think that applies to, to producing. If you're doing blog or anything where you're writing, it's just, it's like exercise. You have to do it, I don't want to say every day, but you have to have a very regular schedule and stick to it and keep doing it and fold in the feedback as you get along the way, right? Like, you know, I, I can do X, I can do Y, like little ways you can improve as you go. And that to me is, is the way it works. And obviously it requires some level of initial talent. It, it doesn't, it never hurts to be very talented, right? Sure. If you're an amazing <laughs> singer, then you're gonna have a better singing career. But, um, you know, effort matters for a lot. Uh, the more you do something with, you know, consistent practice the better you'll get at it now there's also this argument that you could have 10 years of experience as a programmer or you could have one year of experience 10 times right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the idea is that as you do something you're actually getting better at it you're 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 methodically trying to improve uh, on the programming side they call this like code caddis where like you know you're looking at what you did what you did right what you did wrong and using that to guide what you do in the future so there's a sort of a method to it where it's not just like, you know, go run 10 miles every day, but you're thinking, you know, how can I become a better runner, you know, mm -hmm. every time I run and using that to improve your technique as a runner and the way that you run the strategies and, that you use. Mm -hmm. So I think that's key to a lot of stuff like that. If you have a blog or something that you're producing content on that you want to be better, uh, stick a, decide on a schedule early on and stick to it. And that's really the best thing you can do. If you do something for a year in a methodical way, I guarantee you will get better at it. I can't guarantee that it will be, you know, make you world famous or anything, right. but stuff like this has to be its own reward. You're doing it not because I want to be famous, but because you just want to be good at what you're mm -hmm. doing. You know, you want to be better at stuff because that feels good. It feels good to have skill. It just mm -hmm. does. So that's the goal. It's not about the people reading. It's about you. Mm -hmm. It's about you being better at something for you. 
you know? And I think that's the attitude you have to have is like, forget the audience, <laughs> you know, forget all the external motivations. Mm -hmm. Think about the internal motivation of, do you want to be good or not? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be great? You know, and, and that's how you do it. You get up every day and you do something. That's how you get great at something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm trying to do with this show, too, or what I've been doing. Uh, I mean, this is going to be episode number nine. I've already learned so much, not only from the people I'm interviewing, but also from the interviewing process, how to make it better, better quality, better questions, how to connect the dots and things like that. And I'm also I have a blog put or a, a blog section of the site and I've got so much respect for how much content you've been able to push out in a single week because it's so difficult. I mean, um, I, I'm pretty OCD when it comes to writing, so I always go back and fix things. Oh, I don't like this sentence. I don't like that sentence. And so it takes me ages to write blog posts. And if you go back, I, I write about once a week, sometimes maybe twice a week. But I think you're you're writing how many times? Like five, six times a week or something like that, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. In the early days, yeah. I mean, now I can barely write at all. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> because but... I have a lot going on. But in the early days, I, I said, look, I'm going to write a blog post every weekday. That's like, incredible. <laughs> five a week. I have a lot of respect for that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, the, the the logic has changed and so forth. Sure, but, sure. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's the important rule is, like, pick a schedule and stick to it. And one thing you touched on made me remember something, which is you always look at the people that you respect um, that are doing this and succeeding at it and essentially try to emulate them in some way. Mm -hmm. Not exactly, because that would be weird, but <laughs> you look at what they're doing and how they're doing it and try to think, like, how could I achieve that? I mm -hmm. think that's a great way to look at any field where you're trying to be really good is look at the people that are great at it. What do they do? How do they work? You know, and try to emulate some of those things that they're doing. I think that's also very, very healthy. It also lets you have a path of like, you know, where am I going? <laughs> if I was the best in the world at this, what would that be like? You know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and you can sort of see where you're going and you know, maybe what the purpose of all of it is. So that's exactly why I have you on here, Jeff. <laughs> well, that's great, and I, I really appreciate that. And and certainly, you know, when I was starting out, I look, I looked at a lot of people that were doing stuff mm -hmm. and those that I admired. Um, and that's how I met Joel was I really admired him, you know, and the idea for Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange I mentioned was Experts Exchange and I reached a point with my blog where it was very, very popular to the point that my day job seemed kind of quaint, you know, it's like I go to work and I can talk to 20 people maybe mm -hmm. and influence 20 people or I could write on my blog and reach like, you know, 40,000 people and wow, yeah. I started to realize, yeah. well, geez, work seems kind of like not a good use of my time at this point if mm -hmm. I want to sort of do stuff in the world but I didn't know what to do so I, I reached out to all the people that I really respected that, that I admired online and I mailed them and said look I have this big ball of energy around my blog but I don't know what to do with it I want to build mm -hmm. something but I don't know what it is I want to do something with this ball of energy to push it forward like I feel like that's my responsibility it's like I have all this attention that's a great gift that these people are giving me let's do something with it and I emailed people that I admired, and Joel was one of them, and that, that was the genesis of the idea for Stack Overflow. Mm -hmm. So there's another reason to do that, is you might eventually be able to work with these people. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Some who knows what, what life is going to throw at you one day? You know, you could get an email that changes your entire career. Yeah, Hopefully. and from the first days of my blog, I, I reached out to Steve McConnell. One of the very few things I did actually correctly in my life. Oh, yeah. I emailed yeah, yeah. Steve McConnell and said, look, I, I would like to use this, this image from your book, uh, Code Complete, <laughs> as my, on my blog. Is that okay? And I'm so glad I did that, by the way, because that would have been hugely problematic for me later in life. And he was totally cool. He was like, yeah, you can totally use it. Here, you know, just put a copyright Steve McConnell on the image. And, uh, you know, it's good to also have that relationship. Now, not that Steve McConnell have necessarily worked together, but that's another person who I, I really liked what he achieved in his life. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, how can I do things like that? How can I reach other developers essentially make them better, right? Like that's what Stack Overflow is. To some extent, that's what Discourse is. It's a, it's a more general tool, but it, it's all about learning to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what Code Complete was, was like this, uh, this amazing manual of how to be a much, much better programmer. And that's ultimately what I said I want to do. It's like I would like to help other people be better programmers. Uh, and that's a great goal. You know, if you look deeply at what, what Steve McConnell did, that's what he did. He just did it in a different form. He did it with a book. It's an amazing book, but then Stack Overflow did it at more industrial scale of like, <laughs> how do you reach every developer on the planet, right, and make mm -hmm. them and let them help each other be better. In a nutshell, because I know on your website you have a recommended section for reading, and Code Complete is the number one book on there. I'm pretty sure this was a, a big decision uh, changer for me when I did buy the book. But why why do you recommend this book so much? Can you tell us in a nutshell the main lessons that you took away from the book itself? Well, there are a couple of lessons. One was, 
you know, programming is one of those things where people can be very dogmatic about what's right, what's correct, um, and the right way to do things. And one thing I loved about Steve's book is that it's, it's not preachy in that way. It sort of cited a lot of data. It was the first book about programming I'd seen. Now, this is, again, the mid-90s, right? I probably found this book in 1994, <laughs> really soon after it came out. And I just hadn't read a lot of books that had any data associated with what they were doing. Like, Steve would make points about how to structure your code that, that was backed up by actual data and right. studies that he had found. And I thought that was really powerful. And plus, it wasn't preachy. It was like, well, you know, look, here's what we think works. And here's why we think it works. And it wasn't, you must do this or you suck. <laughs> <laughs> or there, here's the one true way. All, all other ways are, mm -hmm. are, are stupid and you're stupid if you use them. But it's amazing how quickly programmers get to that dogmatic level of, you know, the right way. Uh, I had seen that in my short career, <laughs> even though I didn't have the internet and I'd worked with other programmers. You see that almost immediately because mm -hmm. there's an isolation to working as a programmer. Uh, not so much anymore because the internet and stuff, but you sort of get entrenched in your, your ways of doing things. So I love the appeal to data. I love the very humane approach of like, we do this because uh, this is how people work. There were a lot of appeals in the book to like, not about knowledge, but it was about how you carry and handle yourself as a person that affect the output of what you're doing. In other words, programming at its core is a very human activity and a lot of the output is determined by how you treat the other people on the project mm -hmm. <laughs> and how they treat each other. <laughs> uh, and it's the same argument you'll see about coaching. You know, you can have amazing, say, you know, NBA basketball teams, mm -hmm. amazing talent, but they just can't pull it together because coaching, right? Like coaching is, no matter how much talent you have, these relationships take precedence and determine the output. And that was really deeply threaded through a lot of Code Complete was like character as a person, you know, your team's character, hmm. you know, that kind of stuff really resonated with me as like, that is correct. Like computers are changing all the time. That's true. We know that to be true. Mm -hmm. But people do not. People do not change that much over time. Right, and yeah. Studying the people and how to interact with the people will get you much further in your career than being, you know, an assembly language genius, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was the other key insight from the book was like just how much people matter to the process of software and how you could sort of drill into sort of technical personalities. And a lot of Stack Overflow is a meditation on, you know, how programmers' minds work, what motivates a programmer, because all the tools in Stack Overflow are built to motivate you to do things that are good for you, good for the community, and good for programming the thing, you know, programming the thing that will outlive us all. We'll all be dead and people will still be programming, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. So that's the thing you want to think about carrying forward is like, how do we carry the, the, this art, this craft of programming forward in the deepest sense? You know, that's the most noble goal is like how to move that forward. That thing will be alive long after we're dead. Mm -hmm. And my next question was actually going to be, well, as you said, Code Complete was published in 1993 and then revised again in 2004. That was 11 years ago. And so I was going to ask you, well, you know, with all the changes in technology, how is this book still relevant? But you just answered that. It's it's the people. It's not the, the technology itself. The book teaches people how to code. Um, it, it doesn't depend on, on the technology or anything like that. And I think that's a really important topic uh, just to... to uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for to go after what you were just saying is when you're building a project with other people, you don't, um, you know, a lot of people might argue, well, if you have longer variables, it takes the computer longer to, to compile it or whatever, but that doesn't matter because it's more important for other people to be able to read your code than for the computer to do it because the computer is still going to do it extremely fast. So, uh, you know, I really like that point that you brought up. Uh, I think that's definitely very important. I had to put a disclaimer at the top of my recommended reading list about, you know, look, this this list is as valid ten years from now as it is now. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of books that I pick. It doesn't. It isn't about because <laughs> you do get that criticism a lot. I think it's one of the great confusions of programming is that there's this magic bullet syndrome of, well, I don't need to learn anything about people because I'm using tool X. <laughs> tool X works so well. Yeah. And I was like, well, I hate to break this to you, but you're still going to be trying to get other people to use your project. <laughs> and one of the great things I learned from Steve Yegi who's someone I admire a lot, doesn't write too much anymore, but has written some amazing stuff, is he basically come out and said that, like, look, your most important skill as a programmer is marketing, whether you like it or not. Because no matter what you produce, people have to find it. People have to understand it. People have to be able to use it, right? Mm -hmm. And these are marketing jobs, you know? And not that you should sit down and say, I'm a marketer now, but, like, you want to <laughs> think about how communication with other human beings 
you know, affects everything that you do on the deepest level as a programmer. And those are the skills you want to optimize for. And to be honest, with most programmers, I found that they're very good technically. Most programmers are far beyond technically competent. Not all of them. I mean, there's programmers out there that don't do a great job. Sure. But for the type that will be reading the stuff that I'm writing, they're already so good at the technical stuff that, like, look, you don't need to be any better at that. You need to be better at this other stuff that's going to help you in your life a lot more than being the most awesome Java programmer that has ever lived, right? Right. And, right. and, and Steve Yegi made a great point, which is like, if you think about all the programmers that you admire that have done stuff in the world, you usually don't admire them for their technical prowess. I mean, sometimes you do, but like, it's all the other stuff that goes around that that makes them who they are. Hmm. You know, the fact that they can talk, the fact that they can communicate, the fact that they can convince people that, hey, you're right, we should do this and get excited about something. You know, that's what makes them able to be as famous as they are. It's this other stuff that goes along with being a programmer. And that's what I try to encourage people to learn about. You know, it's like you can be the, re the best loop writer in the world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not gonna. It's not gonna really move your career that far forward. Whereas the art of negotiation, the art of communication, really will. I feel like Steve Jobs is the prime example of that. Definitely. Oh sure. If you look in business, there's a lot of examples. Um, but I think most programmers would do well to have a better balance between the technical skills. And sure. Yeah. I see what the you human mean. skills, the communication skills, the marketing, all this other stuff that we know is very very important. And that's what those books try to touch on. They're still very technical, don't get me wrong. Even if you read Peopleware, you're going to get some great lessons that are very specific to building you know, technical teams and doing cool technical stuff. It's not like you're going to wake up one day and be a pointy-haired manager, although <laughs> to be honest with you, at some level, depending on how far you get in your career, that does actually happen. I hate to break <laughs> this to a lot of people, whoever's listening to this, but um, as you get successful, you, you write less code. Mm -hmm. I have found that to be really true because... For me, at least, writing code is not the most effective way to spend my time to mm. achieve the things that I want to achieve anymore. Now, I still write some code, and I love code, don't get me wrong, but there is a natural progression there of balancing those skills. I had Florian Motlick, the CTO of CodeShip, back on the show a few episodes back, and, and that's what he talked about. He said, uh, you know, a lot of my mentors told me, you know, you're going to be CTO, you're not going to code. That's going to be somebody else's job. And he thought, oh, you know, that happens to all the other ones, but, but not to me. And then right after that, he goes, actually, yeah, it does happen to me. It happens to everyone. Uh, if you're the CTO and you're coding, you're, you're not optimizing your time. So I feel like that's a pretty good example. Check that out if you're interested. But I, let's go back to, uh, to, to Stack Overflow and the technologies you used to build, to build that. Specifically, you built that on .NET, right? That's correct. Why did you decide to build that on .NET? Well, .NET, I, it was a stack I knew really well. There would be no real learning curve for me. I'd spend a lot of time with it. It's also very, very fast because it's compiled. Right. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, all the other problems you have. I mean, it's, it's it's a very, very fast tool set, and that appealed to me. And also, like, I like the language. I have a big respect for Anders, the uh, the architect of the language. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's guiding it really well, and it's got a great blend of sort of the advanced sort of new wave of programming um, and also the classic sort of looping Java stuff was both there. So I felt like it met all the criteria that I that I needed and plus I was very experienced with it. Did you run into any issues as a, ro as a result directly correlated to using .NET? Uh, no, we ran into a, one or two you know sort of framework bugs now and then but Microsoft is pretty responsive. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a great tool chain for an open source tool, but for what we were doing, which was essentially ended up being fully closed source, um, it was great and still is great. The, the performance is outstanding. If you go to Stack Overflow, it's, I still have access to the render time dialogue. Um, <laughs> I'm not at Stack Exchange, but I have yeah. honorary sort of moderator access. Right. And it's just incredible how fast the pages render. <laughs> um, like the home page I was just on renders the whole thing from scratch in 136 milliseconds. Wow. And I just clicked through to a random question. It's like under... Yeah, 20 milliseconds to render that page. No yeah, way. it's very, very fast. Wow. Yeah, you, we, we you... work with Ruby now, and Ruby is yeah. great. Man, it's really tough to get pages to render under 100, 100 milliseconds. <laughs> That's really, really tough. And I also want to talk about this in a little bit, the decision of why to go to Ruby versus .NET. But it seems like I read a blog post or two about cost restri restrictions because of the licenses on .NET. Uh, for example, with, with SQL Server and things like that, 
Did you run into some of those issues where you couldn't scale horizontally your, your databases because it would cost more uh, than just throwing more RAM at it? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, it's no secret. The big cost of the Microsoft stack is SQL Server. That's right. where the licensing gets really, really expensive. Like, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. Kind of expensive. Sure. It's kind of crazy, actually. Um, the licensing of Windows Server is not really that expensive. Okay. So that's sort of the hidden cost. Is you got to really watch out for SQL Server because, man, mm -hmm. uh, that is it's not Oracle level pricing, but it's close. Um, and and that's the really thing that they've run into is that I think they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars per year on uh, wow. SQL Server licensing now. Jeez. <laughs> uh, but you know that was not a concern at the time. And there's also this program called uh, BizSpark that Microsoft does where you get all the stuff for free for three years. Okay. So you can build on everything. And then they've also open sourced big parts of the .NET yeah. mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. infrastructure, which I think is great and a really a great boon for them. Mm -hmm. So that, that has changed a little over time. You also had a few years back, you had a debate between you know renting or buying your own servers. Would that still be a debate today or would you move everything to something like Amazon Web Services, for example? Uh, you can. I mean, it's really you're spending your money in different places. With open source stuff, a fully open source stack, you, end up, you do end up using more hardware, uh, sometimes substantially more, mm -hmm. as much as 10 times more. But the expenses are so high on the licensing side, you can do that. One thing that you have to consider is you have a lot more machines to manage. So you end up with system administrator debt a lot faster. Yeah. I don't think I really anticipated that on our on Discourse. We just hired a full-time system administrator, which was really badly overdue. We had a lot of a debt around system mm -hmm. administration because we have like 11 or 12 servers. Mm -hmm. And... I, I think that's sort of the hidden cost. As you think about system administration, you think about you know just the fact that you, whether you're ho whether you're co-locating it or paying Amazon for it, uh, you still have to outlay money for these servers, right? It's sure. not that much money, but yeah, I mean there is some advantage with. A, in fact, I just retweeted something from uh, Nick Craver, who's still at Stack Exchange. He thinks they could run every as big as Stack Overflow is. He thinks they could run on two servers still. Now, granted, these are two <laughs> big, big servers. They have, <laughs> right. like, you know, They'd 768 have to be. gigabytes, or you know, Jeez. of memory or whatever. But still, there's the big iron approach is not bad, because you end up with a big iron approach because licensing is so expensive mm -hmm. that you can't really afford 50 servers running SQL Server. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just want five instead. So you mm -hmm. end up with a big iron approach, and the big iron approach has scaled. I mean, it's amazing what you can buy if you spend. You know, twenty thousand dollars on a server, you can get some pretty amazing specs these days. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed going back on some of your blog posts from a few years back on Stack Exchange, and I'm pretty sure on your your blog as well, where you talked about the whole process of of receiving these servers and getting them ready, and how one time there was one of the ports that didn't work. It was like port number six that just would not work. All the other ports worked fine, and you had a technician come out and everything like that. And finally, you figured out oh, all I have to do is is upgrade the uh, the firmware. And boom, it worked no problem. So I do recommend if, if people listening have not read those blog posts yet, it's always fun to go back back in time like that and, and see at the kinds of problems that you ran into and how you solve them. Uh, those are definitely some, some good reads. Yeah, and we also have other infrastructure issues, issues at Discourse. Like we run like a billion, well, not a billion, but lots and lots of copies of Redis, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you have other system administrators, and they're fun problems because they're like, you know, lots of little system problems where you're you have a swarm of computers right you're trying to all get to it's really interesting but these are also kind of hard problems there's a lot to be said for hey we just buy one big ass server that has you know a terabyte of memory and just put right. everything on it it's like it does simplify your life to some degree um whereas if you have 10 20 50 servers you're running in sort of a, a swarm like fashion mm -hmm. uh it's just different different technical trade-offs um mm -hmm. they're both fun but i think for the open source reason for discourse we had to pick an open source stack because we wanted people to be able to run it on their own com you know their own servers anywhere you know mm -hmm. i see yeah yeah I, I do want to talk more about that that's some pretty interesting stuff especially when i saw the clients you have at discourse like twitter um github all those using discourse uh you've got to have some serious serious stuff going on behind the scenes so I want to talk more about that but first you left uh, Stack Exchange in 2012 to spend more time with your family and I think that's a really big deal so I want to touch on that right before we move on to discourse can you take us back to that year 
and just walk us through the mindset that made you decide to leave your incredible work that was really at that time just starting to grow. How difficult of a decision was that? Oh, it was very difficult to to leave your baby. Now I still have a good relationship with people at Stack Exchange. I'm not part of the day to day there at all. Um, so I still have a good relationship. It's not like we, we had a fight or anything like that. But mm-hmm. by 2012, I I just had twins. Twins is a major life event. Mm-hmm. It's basically like <laughs> parallel programming. You know, single threaded <laughs> programming is really easy. Well, that's one baby. Multiple babies is parallel programming. It's vastly harder. Right. Uh, so that happened. And the company was getting quite a bit larger. I mean, I think by then there were almost 50 to 100 people there. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of those are salespeople, to be fair. But still, the, the nature of the company was changing. Also, we kind of solved our problem. You know, we had completely displaced Experts Exchange. And we were on a fantastic velocity in terms of, you know, our superhighway was busily humming along and carrying a lot of traffic and getting bigger all the time. So there was an aspect of sort of we achieved what we set out to achieve there. And then also I was just really burned out after... You know, this was my first entrepreneurial thing where if this didn't right. work, I had to go crawling back to a, a day job somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, so failure was not an option kind of, right? Like so I was working I would just regularly work sixty hour weeks. I didn't have any kids at that time. Mm-hmm. Sixty hours was like a normal week to me, you know? Mm-hmm. So there was an aspect of being very burned out where I just wanted yeah, to take some time that. off and figure out what I wanted to do and, you know, be with the kids and you know, and I, I love my family. But one of the things I figured out during that time period was that I'm the type of person where if I don't wake up every day with some kind of mission that I'm on, then it gets really dark for me because Mm -hmm. I don't know who I am anymore. (laughs) Um, And it's really hard for me to function as a human being. So one of the things I figured out from the time period was that I have to be on some kind of mission of some kind. I can't just wake up and be, you know, I have to be on a mission Mm -hmm. from God at some level to be happy as a person. I completely understand that. I'm in the same way. Yeah. yeah, so that was sort of what led me to discourse was that, okay, it's a different kind of project. It's a very, very relevant problem of like all the forum software is just still terrible. We had stopped looking in 2008 because we thought, oh, well, we're building a forum when we set out to build Stack Overflow. And then as I got deeper into it, I realized, no, we're building Q&A. And there's these massive Q&A sites I had never heard of as I did all the research. So I eventually stopped looking at forums because I realized we're not really doing forums. We're doing Q&A. It's its own kind of beast. And when I came out of Stack, people would ask me for advice. And I was like, well, first of all, I don't, I'm not a big advice person. But OK, <laughs> so I would look at it. And part of the advice I would give them is like, you shouldn't be asking me. You should be asking your community what they think of what you're doing, You know, not these mythical experts. Because they probably don't even use your thing. But your community does. So ask your community what you should be doing. That's who you need to be talking to. And they would say, oh, great. Brilliant idea, Jeff. How do I do that? You know, And, and I would say, oh, darn. You'll have to install some kind of software to talk to your users. <laughs> and all of it was terrible. You know, I looked in 2012, I was like, oh, surely there have been improvements in the discussion, typing paragraphs to each other's space. And there really hadn't been. It was still awful, awful software. Mm-hmm. So I wanted something that I could give them and say, hey, here, talk to your community with this. That was kind of like WordPress, where it's like, if someone says to you, hey, I have something to say to the world. <laughs> I want to get on a soapbox and say stuff. <laughs> Then you're like, okay, we'll install WordPress, and there you go. You know, maybe maybe you will have something to say to the world. But at least you had a nice open source solution that had plenty of community around it that worked great, that didn't cost you anything, mm-hmm. and that's what we wanted Discourse to be at the community level was that kind of tool, but for communities, right? Mm-hmm. What kind of technologies are powering Discourse right now? Well, it's a couple things. It's uh, Ruby on Rails in the back end. It's mostly JavaScript. It's a JavaScript ball that the browser downloads and runs an app in your browser that is JavaScript. Okay. That's the, the nature of discourse. Because I believe in a lot of ways that's the future. JavaScript is essentially the way of all things moving forward. <laughs> For a long, yeah. long time, JavaScript is going to be extremely dominant. Uh, and we wanted to ride that crest and say, look, when you click on the link, you get a ball of JavaScript. Just like on your phone when you click download app. <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but imagine if that worked on the web, right? Where you went to a website and just bam, you got the latest version of the app mm-hmm. immediately every time. Wouldn't that be nicer than these manual upgrades you do on your, your phone apps all the time? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the vision with this with this course is it's Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, Postgres, nice modern, you know, database SQL back end, and Redis. Those are the big pieces of discourse. Okay. And they're so all completely open source. Do you still think that in the long term 10 plus years, the Atwood law, uh, which is uh, everything that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. Do you, th- do you still think that's the future? 
today? I think absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've seen nothing to dissuade me from that. And even recently, it's funny because I've been following, you know, Windows 8, even though it's kind of been disastrous (laughs) (laughs) over a period of years. I was like, okay, this is something different. Microsoft's trying something new. Let's try this out. It had IE10, which is actually a pretty good browser, and then IE11. And IE11 has been basically frozen in time, Mm performance-wise, from the day it was released. And that wasn't that long ago. That was like 2013. Right. And it's amazing how slow... From a JavaScript point of view, IE11 is now. Mm-hmm. It's kind of crazy. If you look at the benchmarks of where IE11 is versus Chrome and Firefox, which have had these regular mm-hmm. releases, just in the last two years, they're basically twice as fast wow. as IE11 at JavaScript. Now, isn't that crazy? That right is. now, at the, if you go back in time to 2013, they were still faster, but not twice as fast. So, mm-hmm. like, we're still making these massive improvements in JavaScript execution speed. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much pressure for it to get better, you know, with Node, which is really the V8 engine subtracted from uh, Chrome and put in a container to run any kind of JavaScript you want on your server or on your local machine. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of pressure for JavaScript to get faster, and it still is. And I think last I checked, you guys were using Ember.js for at least part of of your JavaScript. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. I should have mentioned that. I apologize. Yeah, Ember is a major, major piece of our strategy. And that's another thing where it's been fun being part of the open source like we push fixes upstream to ra- we've pushed uh, rails fixes upstream mm-hmm. um, I don't think we've pushed any v8 fixes upstream we pushed ember fixes upstream um, we have a lot of influence into the direction of ember and you know the way they're going and we've seen ember make dramatic strides since we started and getting faster getting more efficient um, mm-hmm. there's this thing called glimmer coming to render or excuse me coming to ember which is a much, much faster style of updating the screen so that we can get better performance. Oh, okay, I'll have to check that out. I haven't really done a whole lot with Ember, just a few you know, to-do app lists, that sort of thing, but I will definitely check that out. And I'm curious because you know, there's the battle between Ember and AngularJS and all those different ones. And you, you don't, from what I understand, you don't seem like the type to switch to a language just because it's getting more media press or it's cooler or whatever. And that's why I want to ask your opinion of, of why you chose Ember instead of another framework like Angular that's rapidly growing in popularity. Well, I didn't really make that choice. I, Robin Ward, my co-founder, when I was deciding what technologies to use for discourse, I hooked up with Robin early on. And Robin wrote this really cool thing called Forum Wars with a Z, which is like an online game about forums with its <laughs> own forum attached. So it's like a PhD in forum culture. <laughs> And I told him, I was like, well, I think we want to build this as a ball of JavaScript, but I don't know what to use. And I just let him go out and decide because he had this deep Ruby background. So that clinched the techno- the choice of Ruby on the back end. And he came back and liked Ember. And I said, okay, great, let's do it. And it reminded me of early on in Stack Overflow, we were trying to figure out, you know, we had some JavaScript stuff on the client that we were doing. And, and Jared Dixon the first programmer I worked with on Stack Overflow had picked jQuery. You know, this is back in 2008 before mm-hmm. jQuery was like super world dominant. <laughs> um, but I feel like we, we, we tend to make the right choices here. Like I'm, I'm thinking that Ember is going to be pretty dominant in this world moving forward, particularly with Glimmer. It's just taken a while mm-hmm. to get it where it needs to be. But I'm very hopeful with Glimmer and the other stuff that's coming down the pike for Ember 2.0 that you know, I'm really optimistic about where it's going. Great. And if you want to build a complex application on the client in JavaScript, then Ember is a great choice. Uh, Angular, we, we haven't looked at it much. I know they changed a lot in Angular 2.0. They basically redefined their entire space. Of, of, yeah. of A lot of people were kind of upset about it, actually. <laughs> Whereas Ember has been more iterative in the way that they approach stuff. Mm-hmm. So you don't break break your application as often i guess <laughs> yeah there's still major changes though like every time we release a new version of discourse we're on discourse 1.3 now okay and every may every point release of discourse for us is a major release like months of work um we update to the latest ember and that is not trivial <laughs> because right. ember is definitely marching forward they're mm-hmm. changing stuff but they try to do it in a way where there's a path forward it's not just like throw out all your old work and build the new way <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have three co-founders right yeah uh robin in uh toronto um, Sam Saffron in Australia, and then me in the Bay Area, just three. Uh, how big of a team do you have right now? Like seven people. Seven people, okay. Wow, that's that's not a lot of people considering how much is going on right now. And that's including the uh, the sysadmin you just hired, right? Yep, that is yeah. including, mm-hmm. yep. So up until recently, you've only had six, which yeah. is uh, not a lot of people for the amount of, of work you're doing. 
Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, open source makes it easy to do a lot with, uh, air quote, a little. Meaning we still have a lot, a lot of input from the community. We get, um, if you go to github.com um, slash discourse, you'll see all the open source stuff that we do there, of which discourse is the main project. And you see we have, I think, like 400 contributors now. Look up the numbers. Um, 453 contributors, 117 releases, and 14, almost 15,000 nice. submits. So it's very all very nice. public, you know, so people can jump in, help with the documentation. They can give us feedback on meta discourse. Like the project isn't just these six or seven people. It's everyone that's that's running a discourse, you know, that gives us feedback. Um, it's all our customers that are paying us, essentially subsidizing the work that we're doing. <laughs> um, and and there's, there's, there's a number of people that contribute code to discourse, not just us. So why... Why did you choose Ruby on Rails instead of .NET since you already had so much experience with that? Was it just one of your other co-founders had more experience with it, so you wanted to go with that? Or were there other factors playing in your, in your decision? Uh, it was pretty much just, uh, well, .NET was never really a choice. I wrote about this on my blog where I wrote a blog entry called Why Ruby. Mm -hmm. That really elaborates on this. But when it comes to open source, .NET is not a great choice because, no, they, they've changed some of this in the last year, year right. and a half. But historically, it's just, it, you know, you have to download, you have to be essentially be on a Microsoft platform to really do anything meaningful. Now, this is also kind of true of Rails, where if you try to do Rails on Windows, you're going to be in a world of pain for the most part. <laughs> so, but it's an open source stack. Anybody can download the operating system for free. They can get everything for free. Whereas with Microsoft, at some level, it was like you had to get a official license thing from Microsoft. Uh, whether it's the operating system, SQL Server, something. Some part of the stack would require you to get something licensed. And that's just a barrier to participation. And I think there's good open source community in .NET, but there's an amazing open source community around stuff like Rails, stuff like Python. Um, and we were really shooting for this is an open source project from day zero. And we want a stack that is compatible and friendly to open source, um, as friendly as possible. So that was really the largest motivation was this is open source, so we have to use an open source stack from top to bottom. So with the recent .NET open sourcing, if you didn't have to, to rewrite any of your application, would you still stick to Ruby on Rails, or would you then switch back to, to .NET? No, I would definitely stick with Ruby. I mean, I think one year of you know changing direction doesn't count for you know 20 years of the other stuff. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. The history is just not there. Now, it's a good trend, and they should do that. And I totally applaud these moves, but... You know, it wasn't born that way, basically, mm -hmm. right? I know you're not a huge fan of PHP, <laughs> but have you kept up with any of the recent changes with PHP 7, for example, or anything like that? No, I really haven't. No? I, okay. try, I try to avoid looking at PHP. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you your opinion on it, but I, I guess we'll just skip that section. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have an opinion. I, I don't use it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you've had a lot of experience with Stack Overflow and the Stack Exchange where, I mean, it was on a massive scale. What kinds of technical blunders or management blunders do you think you've been able to avoid at Discourse because of that experience, that previous experience that you had? Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. I think to some extent we, all, we make all new mistakes. Um, I think discourse for me was a chance to go in a different direction, the direction of discussion, not, not Q&A. It's an open source versus a closed source. So it's kind of me going in a completely different direction mm -hmm. of like trying different stuff, you know, not the same stuff I'd done before. Mm -hmm. um, parts that are similar are really just all the stuff I write about on my blog and I talked about earlier in Code Complete was like the, the human stuff of how do people find this? How can they understand it? Will they, will they use it? Can they even install it? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, how do you sort of get it in people's hands? How do you get it in front of people? How do you get them to think about it? Um, I think those are problems that I thought about a lot with Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange. In fact, I wrote another blog entry. Uh, I'll try to cite it for you. I can't remember the exact name, but basically the thrust of it was whenever there was a discussion about Stack Overflow, say in 2011 or 2010, it was always like, oh, you know, I could write this whole thing in a day. You know, everything you've written. <laughs> A day, which and part of that was it's really true. If you just looked at the basics of what the code did, you know, it wouldn't take you more than maybe a week to replicate Stack mm -hmm. Overflow. But if you looked at where I, where I actually spent my time, it was a lot of it was just like you know interacting with the community, figuring out what we're supposed to be building, mm -hmm. um, figuring out you know where the pain points are in the product, right? Um, all this stuff had very little to do with the code. But everything to do with the success of the project, you know. Plus, like making money, we we're trying to figure out like how are we going to make this a sustainable business. Yeah, right. 
you know, all that stuff. All the, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a project, and very little of that is let's sit down and write code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in many ways, that's the smallest part of the project is let's sit down and start writing code. <laughs> and that's the stuff that I really learned about on Stack Overflow was Interesting. not so much the code writing stuff, but like how do you just manage what the hell it is you're doing? For example, <laughs> you know, you don't have a job anymore. You wake up every day and nobody's telling you what to do. You have no idea what you're supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. right? You wake up every day, it's like, what do I work on today? And there's nobody to tell you what you're supposed to be working on. That's insanely hard, I have to say. But you say. should just figure it out. Like, and that's the problem. Like, that's that's the stuff that I learned about and yeah. thought about on Stack Overflow. It wasn't like how to become a better programmer. It was like, how do I figure out what the hell it is I'm supposed to do every day? Like, what are we supposed to be working on? What actually matters? You know, and that. How do you figure that out? Well, a lot of it is, you know, trial and error. Um, I think I have this philosophy I call three things, which is every day there's just three things you have to accomplish. Don't You can have some giant research notebook where you keep track of stuff. I'm not mm -hmm. against writing things down in the general sense, but forget these long to-do lists. Just what three things are you going to accomplish today? Mm -hmm. That's it. Three things, right? One, two, three. <laughs> Try to get those three things done. For example, today, you know, this interview with you is one because it was on my calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, Something I want to do, something I commit to is like this needed to get done. I can't let you down. <laughs> I committed <laughs> Thank you. to this. Thank you very um, much. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to. I'm just saying it's like this is one of my three things for today. Right? right, right. And so I think that helps you isolate like what matters, what's important. Because I have this philosophy that anything that's really important, like you don't really have to write it down because like it'll keep bubbling up. Like people, people will keep asking you about it. It'll mm -hmm. keep coming mm -hmm. up. Um, and things that you don't really need to do, like just don't matter like it, nobody bugs you because it didn't matter if you did that thing right mm -hmm. uh so you know anything that's truly important I, I don't worry because i figure the universe and the people that that rely on me are going to let me know <laughs> that i should be working on x mm -hmm. uh they're going to remind me but just the, the idea of focusing on picking the three top things to do today just getting those three things done is a good way of keeping clarity around what you're supposed to be doing um and how things are working how do you find this this team of people that you can hire and surround yourself with that will call you out if you're working on the wrong tasks or doing the wrong thing or focusing on on whatever it is you're focusing? How do you find these these types of people? Well, I think you that, that when you have a distributed team like we do, and we had a distributed team on Stack Overflow, there's still a very large distributed team at Stack Exchange. There's a lot of people in the offices in New York and uh, London and Denver, mm -hmm. but. I think when you're hiring remotely, it is important to hire people that can sort of figure out what needs to be done without being told. In other words, right. they will figure out what they need to be working on and can do that. I think that's a key thing you hire for when working remotely is can you self-motivate and can you self-determine what you're supposed to be working on. And also, if you look at really good management of like, you know, air quote management, it's essentially letting people have the power to make their own decisions. You know, and saying, "Look, you know better than I do about this stuff. Let's talk mm -hmm. about it." But like, you make the decision because you're the one that's going to be doing the work. So a lot of decisions on discourse is not like me dictating. We shall do X. We shall do Y. It's like you guys tell me how you think we should handle this, right? And I'll have opinions because we all have opinions, and we'll have various priorities about you know customers tend to get priority at discourse because they're paying us money. <laughs> so we, <laughs> have, you know, I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, but we also have a commitment to the product. Like we're not going to put things in that make the product worse or weird or you know harder to use or sketchy. Um, but a lot of you know decision making is empowering the people you work with to make their own damn decisions mm -hmm. about what they should be doing, what we should be doing. You know, and Joel, this... I got to give Joel props. Joel is very very good at this. When I worked with Joel, he essentially gave me complete control. I mean, we just had a weekly call which turned into the Stack Overflow podcast every week. And Joel was the master of this stuff, of like hiring smart people and just getting out of their way, letting mm -hmm. them do stuff, you know? And that's kind of what Joel did with me. He's like, okay, we're going to build Stack Overflow. You just build it. And he had opinions, <laughs> he had insights and stuff. But he would never, you must do X, you must do Y. That's not Joel's style. He's like, you know, I, I trust you. You're going to make the right decisions. And if you make the wrong decisions, that's going to happen. That's okay, right? <laughs> we'll figure mm -hmm. it out. And that's a very powerful style of management. And certainly when you hire remotely, you have to really kind of optimize for that that kind of decision making and people who are comfortable with that. So even when you bring people on the team, you just basically, I mean, they, they've done their research on the application, obviously, and they know about it and what you expect from them. But do you have to kind of guide them at the beginning and, and show them how you work first? Or do you just pick people that just can just figure it out from the get go? Well, we tend to hire from the community. So it's people that already know the project. It's an open source gotcha. project, right? So there's yeah. nothing really hidden from view. 
That makes um, sense. Now, with the, system, the, the sysadmin we just hired, it has been more challenging because we do have all this hidden infrastructure that we try to shield people from because you don't need mm. it. it shouldn't, I mean, we, we talk about it on our blog. It's not a secret, but like you shouldn't have to care what our internal routing looks like for our application, right? Because yeah. from your perspective as a customer, it just works. I click the button, I get a discourse, I pay you guys money, and things just work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, now, with the sysadmin, that has been challenging. Like one of my interview strategies for programmers is give them some public facing project. Like go implement this feature on our open source application, right? Mm -hmm. That's an exercise. But with a system administrator, <laughs> you can't really do that because all your infrastructure is kind of private. You know, you don't want the world messing with your infrastructure. I mean the bad there are bad guys out there, right? Sure. <laughs> so it's like all of a sudden it's like, well here's, you know, the secret logins to all our servers. Enjoy. <laughs> it was <laughs> right. really hard to That'd come be a great up idea. With. <laughs> well, we came up with some ways to do it for system administrators. We gave them some hypotheticals about you know problems we actually had at Discourse and how they would handle it, scaling problems and things like mm -hmm. that. And that worked pretty well. But I couldn't give them a live problem because I would give them a live problem on our live infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. that's not really yeah. a good strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it works great for programmers. You know, particularly on an open source project, you can just say, hey, how would you you know go implement feature X and show me what you have. Right? It's a real feature <laughs> on your real product. Right? You know, this is this is an interesting format. I actually usually do more technical interviews, but for some reason, for this interview, I kind of wanted to shift away from that just a little bit and get more insight into how you do this kind of management and community building and team building and, and things like that and what, where you come from and how you've done it. And uh, I'm just curious to hear from the community what you think about this format, if you thought I should have added more technical detail to this or not. And if you think I, sh I should have and you're kind of disappointed, then go to, uh, I actually, I'll, I'll put links below the video. I have read a few blog posts from the guys that co-founded Discourse and that are currently working there. They have a lot of really good technical details where, for example, one of them talks about AmberJS versus AngularJS and why they picked or why he picked AmberJS instead and in, in the, the downfalls of Angular, etc. And there's a lot more than, uh, that I've, than we've covered in this interview. So if you want more te technical detail, check out the links in the, in the write-up below the video. But just let me know what you think about this format. And Jeff, do you have anything you'd like to add? I know we're about to hit an hour here, so we're going to be wrapping up. But did you have anything else that, that you think we should be adding to the interview? Nope, just check out my project at you know, discourse.org and of course stackexchange.com. Awesome. I'll try to post some of those links as well from your blog where uh, it's relevant to what we talked about and also from Stack Exchange, some of the old posts where you were messing with hardware and <laughs> upgrading for, for ports that didn't work, etc. So Jeff, I really, really appreciate you making the time to do this. I had a fantastic time researching everything, reading your posts, and thanks a lot for doing this interview. Yeah, thanks. I hope it was useful to people. If people want to get in touch with you, how, how do you recommend they do that? Uh, they can just contact me on my blog. There's an about link on the sidebar there. Awesome. And I think you're on Twitter as well, right? I'm not sure what your Twitter yep. handle is, but coding, I'll look it up. At Coding Horror on Twitter, too. Yeah. Perfect. Je thanks again, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Yep. Bye. <laughs>